Macroscopic quantum phenomena refer to processes showing quantum behavior at the macroscopic scale, rather than at the atomic scale where quantum effects are prevalent. The best known examples of macroscopic quantum phenomena are superfluidity and superconductivity. Other examples include the quantum Hall effect and concerted proton tunneling in ice. Since 2000 there has been extensive experimental work on quantum gases, particularly Bose-Einstein condensates. Between 1996 to 2003 four Nobel Prizes were given for work related to macroscopic quantum phenomena. Macroscopic quantum phenomena can be observed in superfluid helium and in superconductors, but also in dilute quantum gases and in laser light. Although these media are very different, their behavior is very similar as they all show macroscopic quantum behavior. Quantum phenomena are generally classified as macroscopic when the quantum states are occupied by a large number of particles or the quantum states involved are macroscopic in size. Consequences of the macroscopic occupation The concept of macroscopically occupied quantum states is introduced by Fritz London. In this section it will be explained what it means if the ground state is occupied by a very large number of particles. We start with the wave function of the ground state written as with psi the amplitude and the phase. The wave function is normalized so that the physical interpretation of the quantity depends on the number of particles. Fig. 1 represents a container with a certain number of particles with a small control volume delta V inside. We check from time to time how many particles are in the control box. We distinguish three cases. 1. There is only one particle. In this case the control volume is empty most of the time. However, there is a certain chance to find the particle in it given by EQ. The chance is proportional to delta V. The factor psi psi is called the chance density. 2. If the number of particles is a bit larger there are usually some particles inside the box. We can define an average, but the actual number of particles in the box has relatively large fluctuations around this average. 3. In the case of a very large number of particles there will always be a lot of particles in the small box. The number will fluctuate but the fluctuations around the average are relatively small. The average number is proportional to delta V and psi psi is now interpreted as the particle density. In quantum mechanics the particle probability flow density JP can be derived from the Schrödinger equation to be with Q the charge of the particle, and the vector potential, with EQ. If the wave function is macroscopically occupied the particle probability flow density becomes a particle flow density. We introduce the fluid velocity versus via the mass flow density the density is so EQ. Results in this important relation connects the velocity, a classical concept, of the condensate with the phase of the wave function, a quantum mechanical concept, superfluidity. Below the lambda temperature, helium shows the unique property of superfluidity. The fraction of the liquid that forms the superfluid component is a macroscopic quantum fluid. The helium atom is a neutral particle, so Q equals zero. Furthermore, when considering helium-4, the relevant particle mass is m equals m, so Eq reduces to for an arbitrary loop in the liquid. This gives due to the single-valued nature of the wave function with n integer. We have the quantity as the quantum of circulation. For a circular motion with radius r in case of a single quantum when superfluid helium is put in rotation, Eq will not be satisfied for all loops inside the liquid unless the rotation is organized around vortex lines. These lines have a vacuum core with a diameter of about 1 a. The superfluid helium rotates around the core with very high speeds. Just outside the core, the velocity is as large as 160 meters per second. The cores of the vortex lines and the container rotate as a solid body around the rotation axis with the same angular velocity. The number of vortex lines increases with the angular velocity. Note that the two right figures both contain six vortex lines, but the lines are organized in different stable patterns. Superconductivity 
In the original paper Ginsberg and Landau observed the existence of two types of superconductors depending on the energy of the interface between the normal and superconducting states. The Meissner state breaks down when the applied magnetic field is too large. Superconductors can be divided into two classes according to how this breakdown occurs. In type 1 superconductors, superconductivity is abruptly destroyed when the strength of the applied field rises above a critical value Hc. Depending on the geometry of the sample, one may obtain an intermediate state consisting of a baroque pattern of regions of normal material carrying a magnetic field mixed with regions of superconducting material containing no field. In type 2 superconductors, Raising the applied field past a critical value Hc1 leads to a mixed state in which an increasing amount of magnetic flux penetrates the material, but there remains no resistance to the flow of electric current as long as the current is not too large. At a second critical field strength Hc2, superconductivity is destroyed. The mixed state is actually caused by vortices in the electronic superfluid, sometimes called fluxons because the flux carried by these vortices is quantized. Most pure elemental superconductors, except niobium and carbon nanotubes, are type 1, while almost all impure in compound superconductors are type 2. The most important finding from Ginzburg Landau theory was made by Alexei Abrikosov in 1957. He used Ginzburg Landau theory to explain experiments on superconducting alloys and thin films. Fluxoid quantization for superconductors The bosons involved are the so-called Cooper pairs which are quasi-particles formed by two electrons, hence m equals 2 m and q equals 2 e where m and d are the mass of an electron and the elementary charge. It follows from eq that integrating eq over a closed loop gives us in the case of helium we define the vortex strength and use the general relation where phi is the magnetic flux enclosed by the loop. The so-called fluxoid is defined by in general the values of kappa and phi depend on the choice of the loop. Due to the single-valued nature of the wave function and eq, the fluxoid is quantized. The unit of quantization is called the flux quantum. The flux quantum plays a very important role in superconductivity. The Earth magnetic field is very small, but it generates one flux quantum in an area of 6 by 6 micrometers. So, the flux quantum is very small, yet it was measured to an accuracy of 9 digits as shown in EQ. Nowadays the value given by EQ is exact by definition. In Fig. 3 two situations are depicted of superconducting rings in an external magnetic field. One case is a thick-walled ring and in the other case the ring is also thick-walled but is interrupted by a weak link. In the latter case we will meet the famous Josephson relations. In both cases we consider a loop inside the material. In general a superconducting circulation current will flow in the material. The total magnetic flux in the loop is the sum of the applied flux phi and the self-induced flux phi s induced by the circulation current thick ring the first case is a thick ring in an external magnetic field. The currents in a superconductor only flow in a thin layer at the surface. The thickness of this layer is determined by the so-called London penetration depth. It is of mu m size or less. We consider a loop far away from the surface so that versus equals zero everywhere so kappa equals zero. In that case, the fluxoid is equal to the magnetic flux. If versus equals zero eq, reduces to taking the rotation gives using the well-known relations and shows that the magnetic field in the bulk of the superconductor is zero as well. So, for thick rings, the total magnetic flux in the loop is quantized according to interrupted ring. Weak links Weak links play a very important role in modern superconductivity. In most cases weak links are oxide barriers between two superconducting thin films, but it can also be a crystal boundary. A schematic representation is given in Fig. 4. Now consider the ring which is thick everywhere except for a small section where the ring is closed via a weak link. 
the velocity is zero except near the weak link. In these regions the velocity contribution to the total phase change in the loop is given by the line integral is over the contact from one side to the other in such a way that the end points of the line are well inside the bulk of the superconductor where versus equals zero. So the value of the line integral is well defined with EQs. And without proof we state that the supercurrent through the weak link is given by the so-called DC-Josephson relation the voltage over the contact is given by the AC-Josephson relation the names of these relations are misleading since they both hold in DC and AC situations. In the steady state EQ shows that V equals zero while a non-zero current flows through the junction. In the case of a constant applied voltage EQ can be integrated easily and gives substitution in EQ, gives this as an AC current. The frequency is called the Josephson frequency. 1 mu V gives a frequency of about 500 MHz. By using EQ, the flux quantum is determined with the height precision as given in EQ. The energy difference of a Cooper pair, moving from one side of the contact to the other, is delta E equals 2 electron volts. With this expression EQ, can be written as delta E equals H nu which is the relation for the energy of a photon with frequency nu. The AC-Josephson relation can be easily understood in terms of Newton's law. We start with Newton's law substituting the expression for the Lorentz force and using the general expression for the co-moving time derivative gives EQ gives so take the line integral of this expression. In the end points the velocities are zero so the V2 term gives no contribution. Using an EQ with Q equals 2E and M equals 2 me gives EQ. DC squared figure 5 shows a so-called DC squared. It consists of two superconductors connected by two weak links. The fluxoid quantization of a loop through the two bulk superconductors and the two weak links demands if the self-inductance of the loop can be neglected the magnetic flux in the loop phi is equal to the applied flux with B the magnetic field applied perpendicular to the surface and A the surface area of the loop. The total supercurrent is given by substitution of EQ and gives using a well-known geometrical formula we get since the sim function can vary only between minus 1 and plus 1 a steady solution is only possible if the applied current is below a critical current given by note that the critical current is periodic in the applied flux with period phi. The dependence of the critical current on the applied flux is depicted in fig. 6. It has a strong resemblance with the interference pattern generated by a laser beam behind a double slit. In practice the critical current is not zero at half integer values of the flux quantum of the applied flux. This is due to the fact that the self-inductance of the loop cannot be neglected. Type 2 superconductivity Type 2 superconductivity is characterized by two critical fields called BC1 and BC2. At a magnetic field BC1 the applied magnetic field starts to penetrate the sample, but the sample is still superconducting. Only at a field of BC2 the sample is completely normal. For fields in between BC1 and BC2 magnetic flux penetrates the superconductor in well-organized patterns. The so-called abricotive vortex lattice similar to the pattern shown in Fig. 2. A cross-section of the superconducting plate is given in Fig. 7. Far away from the plate the field is homogeneous. But in the material superconducting currents flow which squeeze the field in bundles of exactly one flux quantum. The typical field in the core is as big as one tesla. The currents around the vortex core flow in a layer of about 50 nanometers with current densities on the order of 15 times 1012 A per square meter. That corresponds with 15 million ampere in a wire of 1 mm squared. Dilute quantum gases. The classical types of quantum systems, superconductors and superfluid helium, were discovered in the beginning of the 20th century. Near the end of the 20th century, scientists discovered how to create very dilute atomic or molecular gases, cooled first by laser cooling and then by evaporative cooling. 
they are trapped using magnetic fields or optical dipole potentials in ultra-high vacuum chambers. Isotopes which have been used include rubidium, strontium, potassium, sodium, lithium, and hydrogen. The temperatures to which they can be cooled are as low as a few nanokelvin. The developments have been very fast in the past few years. A team of NIST and the University of Colorado has succeeded in creating and observing vortex quantization in these systems. The concentration of vortices increases with the angular velocity of the rotation, similar to the case of superfluid helium and superconductivity.